together with Zagreb's cultural center and student cultural centers in Belgrade and Ljubljana, youth platform in Novi Sad, which is a northern province in uh, Serbia, was one of the hubs of the so-called new art practice in Yugoslavia in the early 1970s. Like other youth cultural centers, youth platform had its visual arts, music and film programs, as well as a publication wing that issued influential art and literature journal Polja Fields and a book series. It supported the work of artists and groups such as conceptual art group Code K O D, which had its oh there we go. <laughs> which had its inaugural performance there on April 9, 1970. The following year, year another conceptual art group emerged in Novi Sad, um, and uh, already its name, the unpronounceable, whatever it is, set of signs, suggests its members' interest in literature, primarily poetry and linguistic phenomena in general. Comprised of visual and uh, visual artists and poets, the members of these groups experimented with poetry, visual art, and performance. Already by 1972, the two groups were well established and active in youth platform and beyond. That year, COD member Mirko Radojic co-edited a special issue of the journal Polja dedicated to conceptual art, and Vladimir Kopitzel of the other group uh, put together a volume titled Artist's Body as a Subject and Object of Art. Uh, the issue of Polja, which came out in 72, was a really an up-to-date collection of uh, theoretical works on, on conceptual art together with the works of conceptual artists from Yugoslavia at that point. Art, in Artist's Body, Kopitzel put together a portfolio on body art that, includes, that included texts by Willoughby Sharp and Ginter Bruce, and documentation of the work by Vito Conci, Michael Neumann, Joseph Boys. Again, very up to date. With Radojic and his friend from COD, Slobodan Tishma, who also has a very interesting career, serving as artistic associates in Youth Platform's visual arts program, only a month after the publication of Kopitzel's Artist's Body, the gallery presented the first post-World War II exhibit of the Yugos Yugoslav avant-garde journal Zenit, which the poet Ljubomir Micic published from 1921 to 1926 in Zagreb and Belgrade. In an interview published in Novi Sad journal Stražilovo, the art historian Zoran Markus who was one of the main contributors for, for the res, uh, to the res, uh, resurgence of interest in Mitzic's work, reminded the readers that Zenitism was the only Yugoslavism between the wars, and that because of its strong association with constructivism, it laid the groundwork for conceptual art. There is nothing con controversial about this statement. The suggestion that the so-called neo-avant-garde continues and restates the traditions and insights of the historical avant-garde was well established in Europe and the US at that time. Around that very time, Rosalie Goldberg codified this idea in her performance, li performance live art from 1909 to the present, according to which the new art form of performance emerged from experiments of Italian and Russian futurists, and it went from there with Dada, Surrealists, and the Bauhaus to post-World War II Neo-Dada in Europe and the US, happenings of the 1960s, and the art of ideas in the following decade. So, when it comes to Zenit and Cod, everything seemed to go according to the, to the textbook, except that it didn't. Poetry plays a significant and often insufficiently acknowledged role in early performance history. While in numerous editions of her book, Goldberg took futurist poetry readings, Serate, as reliable starting point of performance history, and scholars such as Michael Kirby and Annabelle Meltzer elaborated on techniques and strategies in futurist and other performance practice, the prominence of poetry in live art 
quickly pales in comparison with visual experimentation and corporeal presence of the artist. We all remember the image of Hugo Ball doing this in Cabaret Voltaire. We don't remember the poem that he recited, Gaji Beribimba. It appears as if poetry and performance briefly crossed their paths at the moment of the new arts form's inception and then continued in their separate ways. Indeed, aspects of poetry performance such as cadence and diction are, har are hardly relevant to performance art and remain firmly confined within the art of recitation or poetry theater. Still, I want to suggest that poetry remind, remained deeply ingrained, ingrained in performance, if not at the level of theater, then certainly at the level of utterance. The moment of emergence of performance, in, of performance art in the early 20th century was marked by elimination of semantics from poetry and with it of the concerns with versification, rhyme and poetic narration. Poets who replaced words with bodies and sounds did not worry about rhyming patterns because, because they, they had nothing to rhyme. What performance retains from poetry is this effort to overcome discursive language and in, and in doing so to transpose its logic to the realm of the non-linguistic. In other words, performance preserves what Martin Heidegger recognized as the difficulty, difficulty of forming the work of language, and even more, the difficulty of going over from the work of the eyes to the work of the heart. Experimental poetry often collapses the work of lang language and the work of the eyes, and routinely adds to it the work of the body. Textbooks also assert that performance came in waves, so that this continuity emerge, emerges as one of the main features of its history. Any attempt to establish a narrative of performance needs to get across these gaps, and it often does so by establishing connections between cl clearly identifiable and observable properties of the work. Not surprisingly, the work of the eyes is more readily inspectable than the work of the heart. That is especially true for a culture in which the, the inherent discontinuity of performance history is additionally punctuated by violent political changes. The case in point, of course, is Yugoslavia, where neo-avant-garde had very tenuous relationships with the interwar avant-garde movements. This was not only the result of an oppressive political regime, which in Yugoslavia was idios idiosyncratic to say the least, even uneven across time and space and highly dependent on local political situations. On the one hand, many members of the pre-war generation of experimental poets, such as uh, the expressionist Miroslav Krleža or the surrealist Ristich, became really the members of the establishment after the war, and because of that, the avant-garde artists were totally uninterested in their works. On the other hand, the Yugo Dadas from the 1920s simply disappeared in the 30s. Branko Aleksic stopped making art, uh, writing poetry. Another one, very interesting character, Moni de Bulli, just left Belgrade and went to Paris, where he joined René Dumal's surrealist group, uh, uh, Le Grand Jou. So, Considering all of that, in that setting, upon its, its rediscovery in the late 1960s and early 1970s, Zenitism was seen as a way to fill the gap between historical and neo-avant-garde in Yugoslavia. Subtitled, this, this is like a Dada's performance in its own way. Okay, hope, okay, there we go. Subtitled An International Journal for Art and Culture, Zenit published avant-garde writers and artists from the newly formed Kingdom of Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes. Uh, the kingdom was formed in 1918. It became Yugoslavia later. But they also published numerous contributors from abroad, such as Alexander Bloch from 
Soviet Union, Raul Hausmann, Jean Epstein, Trotsky, and Karl Taige, just to name a few. El Lisitsky and Alexander Arkhipenko made visual designs exclusively for Zenit. However, Zenit's feverish activity of the 1920s and 1930s was followed by complete silence. There is a yawning gap in the bibliography of scholarly literature on Ljubomir Micic that sp spans from 1941 to the early 60s. After World War II, there were only a few short entries on Zenitism scattered in dictionaries and encyclopedias of Yugoslav literature. The first critical investigation of Micic's work after Second World War was Radomir Konstantinovich's essay, Who is Barbaro Genius, from 1966. The title of the essay refers to the figure that first appears in Manifesto of Zenitism that Micic published in 1921, together with Boško Tokin and Ivan Gol, a German-French expressionist poet. If this flips, we will see the cover. There we go. Uh, of uh, Manifesto of Zenitism. Uh, and Ivan Gol, in, uh, importantly, was the, the co-editor of Zenit from October 21 to April 22. Already in the first line of his section of the manifesto, Mitzic writes about that Barbaro genius is a naked man, referring to authenticity and spontaneity of this figure. And a year later, in his single authored uh, Zenith Manifesto of 1922, he proclaims, uh, we don't, there we go, we don't want to be Europeans. We're the Balkanites, Easterners. We're creating Balkan art, yes, Balkan culture. We want Balkanization of Europe. And concludes by announcing that Zenitism is the new art of awakened Balkans and liberated Barbaro genius. This idea will remain Mitsuchi's constant obsession all the way down to his last book, Barbaro Genius, the De-Civilizator, the De published in French in 1938, and it was translated in Serbian only in 1989. Placing Micic, Micic's idea in the context of privitimism in European art and of Serbian bourgeois turn of the 20th century ideology of Europeanization of the Balkans, Konstantinovich suggests that Barbaro genius is at the same time an outcrop of the former, of primitivism, and an inversion of the latter. He argues that far from being youthfully effective and irrational, as Mitsic claimed it was, Barbaro genius was a, the result of an internalization of racist Western views of the Balkans. Because of that, his poetry about Barbaro genius, writes Konstantinovich, is merely a poetry of ideas. And as such, it shows that Barbaro genius is only a notion an ideological construction, and precisely by being that notion, it is in deep contradiction with its own self. Konstantinovich cautions that Zenit's poetic and aesthetic shortcomings are negligible in relation to the political consequences of his ideas. In the night, and that's what becomes invisible when we look it outside of the context. When we look at the form of this kind of work, it's very close to Dada of the 20s, but then the contact is, content is radically different. In the, in the 1930s, this ideological contrast, uh, construct acquires a very recognizable shape. Mitsic would reach, quote, chauvinism as the supreme and final form of tribal hatred. In a thoroughly tribal way, he will deny, in his authentic barbarism, the existence of other South Slavic peoples. He foregrounded the Serbs. Better than anything else, this evolution of Dadaism into chauvinism exposes the true content of his barbarism." End quote. This clearly sets apart the only Yugoslav interwar-ism from the conceptual art of the late 60s and early 70s. While it is important to acknowledge that both of them had their attention turned to international art scene, in the latter there were no traces of any interest whatsoever in the law 
local, primitive, archaic, or national. Both in, the, in its politics and its poetics, it was as far from Zenit's ideological construct as it could be. I'll just go on, there we go. In the spring of 1970, on at least three separate occasions, poet and performance artist Vito Acconci put his hand as far down his throat as it could go until he gagged. In January of that year, he joined Terry Fox and Dennis Oppenheim in environmental surfaces, three sim simultaneous situational enclosures, which they performed in Rees Gallery in New York. Documentation of these works was published in Artist's Body in October 1972. This slim, spiral-bound volume featured articles from several sources. New York art journal Avalanche, with which many of us are familiar, catalog from Document Documenta 5 in Castle, and the Slovene magazine Problemi. This selection can be seen as Kopitzel's statement about his and his friends' poetic and artistic affiliations on the one hand, they were interested in international art movements, and on the other, they were particularly close to the Slovene group OHO, which pursued the trajectory of radical integration of art and life, from visual poetry to gallery installations to performance to the commune and cessation of art making as a discrete activity. And here is the connection with MoMA. OHO was featured in information exhibition in the late 60s. Kopitzel considered his work of translation and editing as integral part of his conceptual art practice. While this collection features prominently, as I mentioned, Ginter Bruce, Fo Terry Fox, Bruce Neumann, Neumann and others, Akonchi's work from this period resonates with groups, with members of Novi Sad conceptual art scene because of its position between poetry and performance. Like Akonchi, the members of, you remember, the members of, yeah? started from experimental poetry and language games and then quickly moved towards conceptual art. The art historian Mishko Shuvakovic observed that Kopitzel's work from the early 70s was characterized by an aspiration to cross the threshold of language. For Kopitzel, Anal Shuvakovic claimed, analytical conceptual art is the process of transformation of conceptual art's propositions into analyt analytical and tautological situations. As Kopitzel and his friends repeatedly demonstrated in their performances, these situations fully involved the poet's body. For example, in a performance installation he presented in Youth Platform Gallery in June, July of 73, a line of poetry was projected over his body, then photographed, photographed, reproduced, thus capturing the mediating really function of the body. Taking all of this into consideration, Artist's Body, headlined by Willoughby Sharp's article Body Works from the first issue of Avalanche, is not only an anthology of performance-related texts, but yet Yet another attempt to explore the relationship between the poetic text and the body. Outside of relatively small circle of artists engaged in new art practice, there was little to no interest in investigation of the poetics of the body, especially in literary criticism in Yugoslavia of that time. One significant exception is Radomir Konstantinovich, whose article, Who is Barbaro Genius, as it turned out, belonged to his much larger project of critical exploration of Serbian poetry in the first half of the 20th century. He discussed Micic again in his landmark work, The Philosophy of, the, of Parochialism, 1969, and then again in the long essay in his eight volume study, Being and Language in the Experience of Poets in Serbian Culture of the 20th Century. Uh, there are a couple of images here. I'll just keep, oh, there you go. Well, the full eight volumes of Being and Language came out in 1983, Konstantinovich published most of his essays in literary journals of the 1970s. This colossal work of literary criticism is a systematic and detailed investigation of the relationship between poetic texts and experience, or in other words, between language and the extra-linguistic in the poetry 
produced in a certain language and culture during the first decades of the 20th century. Like conceptual artists who were active at the same time when he worked on this immense critical undertaking, Konstantinovich was, was attentive to the thresholds of language and its entanglement with the body. He found the most daring examples of this poetic engagement, I'm not going to bother you with names, in some uh, uh, late symbolist poets uh, in the early 20th century, in some proto-surrealist work, and also in the work of some members of Belgrade surrealist group. According to Konstantinovich, recitation, just a moment. According to Konstantinovich, recitation only obscures and masks the experiential dimension of poetry. If uh, recitation is a false speech and vain display of poetic craft. Likewise, more often than not, experiments with typography don't challenge the poetic language. Instead, they become, as Konstantinovich observed about uh, Moni de Bulli's visual poems, word drawings. In order to question language as its primary medium, poetry needs more than formal presence of the body. Being more of an ideological than poetic project, Zenitism abstracts the body, he writes. As a figure that epitomizes Zenitist ideology, Barbaro genius is an expression of negation of the West that goes hand in hand with an uncritical affirmation of the East as Mitzic conceived of it, the Balkans, Russia, anti-Europe, and so on. In short, Barbaro genius and his maker know no poetry, according to Konstantinovich, because their negation is false negation. In an, in an uncompromising poetry that aims unstoppably at finding its own limits, quote, the body is not only a principle, a matter of poetic religion, it is also an anti-matter, in languages matter, the pledge of non-being that strives for an absolute lifeness, for an absolute being. I had that on slide. Aha, uh -huh. there you go. For poetry is a revelation, poetry is a revelation and not craft. It is a self-exposure and not self-affirmation. To poetry, true poetry never stops at the first step, but requires a double negation. And this, it is precisely in this gesture of self-negation that poetry reaches the threshold of language and engages the body. The death of language, he writes, is the birth of being. It is a pure presence which resists being spoken and which announces itself precisely in the place where the power of language ceases, where it stops, where there is only so much left of it to make visible its mothering as this birth of being. So the language disappears and something else emerges. Let's pause for a moment to observe how this idea of non-objective materiality of the body resonates with the body work as conceived by early performance theory. Consider Willow B. Sharp's reflection that gave the title to Kopitzel's book, Artist's Body. The artist's own body, writes Willow B. Sharp, is not as important as the body in general. The work is not a solitary celebration of self. As someone said, it's more about using a body than autobiographical. The personality of the artist refines itself out of the work, impersonalizes itself." End quote. This idea of the impersonal also dominates poetry of the body as Konstantinovich conceives of it. The body is an absolute which breaks through. It is a permanently indeterminate someone, a generality which divorces and annihilates the self, he writes. It is not an accident that Konstantinovich brings painting into his discussion of poetry, of the body. I will pick up where I left off a moment ago. So the absolute being obsessed with concrete, 
never sufficient, which in a panicked and excited, admiring and humorous grotesque way distorts the line of a sentence as in the syntax of Picasso's drawing. In his other text, he talks about the syntax of life, stuff like that. Konstantinovich goes on to touch on primitivism of the Fovs and Dadas before he reaches all the way down to the very bottom of language, where he finds the scream and the certain bruitism of the poem, which is the pure song of the matter. That is the edge of language that poetry of the body unearths. If, the, if it strives to go over that edge, what does it find on the other side? And what is the force that pulls it in that direction? If poetry is not a craft but a revelation, its main discovery is, as Konstantinovich writes, the other in otherness, an encounter with identity with non-identical with the non-identical, end quote. This encounter takes place within the poem, not between, the po not between poetry and other media. Maybe this is the right moment to return to the beginning of the textbook genealogy of performance art. As Annette Michelson argued in her landmark essay, There's Still Its Other Face, Abstraction and Cacophony, or What Was the Matter with Hegel? It's a very, very funny essay. The early 20th century experiments with structure of language led to loosening of the signifier from signified. And this was often manifested in the prevalence of sound and image over discursive language in poetry. By the 1970s, this relaxing of syntactical binds extended to include the artist's body, other bodies, objects, sounds, smells, environments, etc. Language is not just one of mat uh, language here becomes just one of materials in this arrangement that can do away with everything except the body itself. It is the body that brings about the true specialization of language and textualization of space. So if we look at uh, performances such as Rasha Todosievich's Drinking Water, a uh, performance from 1974, it is actually an utterance that belongs equally to his performance art of the early 70s and to his text works of the 80s and 90s. Or to get closer to the works I discussed earlier in the paper, the same can be said about Kopitzel's 1973, there is nothing here yet, but there could be a shape that corresponds to it. In conclusion, I just want to sum up by saying that I'm arguing for a field rather than linear genealogical approach to the study of performance or history of performance. I'm not suggested that, uh, suggesting that conceptual artists in Novi Sad read Konstantinovich or were influenced by his literary criticism, nor am I saying that he drew on their work to theorize poetry that explodes language to reach the body. Instead, what I'm suggesting is that at a certain historical junction, Yugoslav culture yielded these ideas about the body and about art, which powerfully illuminate one another. One of their signal insights is that what is spectacular about poetry of the body is not the distortion of text and its picturalization. Poetry of the body is an unsparing awareness of the presence of non-existence, which is language itself, which leads poet to distorted syntax, abandon words, and to grunt, scream, and bleed. If they do so, that's because they can't do otherwise. Poetry of the body is not, a power, is not powered by poet's skill with words, rhymes, and metric rhythms in word by the craft of poetry. Instead, it is powered and driven by an inner necessity which comes from the gravitational pull of the other. It is because of this sense of inevitability, of landing, abandoning one's body to the force of alternity, that the poetry of the body often resembles a spectacle of suffering, body at risk, and the life in free fall.
That is what simultaneously attracts and repels the gaze and the ear to the poetic statements such as Akonchi's Bad Seed or Abramovich's Thomas Lips and to the music of Julia, Julius Eastman's life or in the work being produced as we speak to spatial compositions of Kiwan Thomas. To, we skipped Thomas to Cassiel's social sculpture or Xandra Ibarra's laughter. <laughs> 